Margaret tonight. The reason I'm calling her Margaret or Mrs. Brown is that she was never called Molly during her lifetime. That came about after she died. In fact, in 1933, one of the, one of the columnists for uh, one of our newspapers wrote a book called Timberline. And one of the chapters had the title of, guess what it was called? The Unsinkable Molly Brown. Go figure. So I am so delighted to have you all come and tour this evening. And it is getting windy, so we're getting quickly, or I am getting quickly. Um, just um, one housekeeping thing. If you can't hear me, please let um, please put it in the chat um, box, you know, so I know to speak louder. And please feel free to put in any questions you have. I'll stop periodically for questions. So we're going to go on inside. And I'm going to tell you, I feel like I have a double gun. I have two flashlights because the house is kind of dark. So I will be using the flashlights as well. Okay. Oops. So, um, I want to tell you a little bit about this wonderful house first. Um, this house was built in 1889, and the architect who designed it um, designed a lot of homes in this area, and his name was William Lang. And the Browns were not the first owners. Um, the first owners were friends of theirs, a couple named Isaac and Mary Large. And, um, and this house, when it was built, had the most modern cutting edge technology. Uh, some things you may be noticing um, that it has electricity. Not that many homes had electricity way back then. And this light fixture up here, um, what, is original to the home. What, what you're going to see this evening in the Molly Brown House Museum, about 20% or so was here when the Browns lived here. And, um, and the rest has been donated, but donated, but we kept it to the time period. So this light fixture, I can imagine it's not that, it's very low wattage, about 45 watts, but I can picture women saying, oh my gosh, that's going to show my wrinkles. Not good, but it, but it was a nice thing to have. Um, this home also has, I we had when it was built, central heating. You will you will see a couple of fireplaces, and they're lovely, but not necessarily needed. And the other thing it has that I don't think very many of us would want to live without is in its indoor plumbing and hot running water, and that truly was a luxury item. So. I want to point out some things in this in this room. This is the entry. And one thing I should tell you is that the Browns had staff that worked for them. And their staff were of Irish, um, they were Irish immigrants. And if you if somebody came to see Mrs. Brown or Margaret for, for a visit, that visitor would be escorted to sit in an area of this room called the Turkish Corner. And it's a little bit hard to see. And I'm going to have fun with my flashlight here and show, see if I can show you a little bit. Um, and that would be a time when the when when the member of the staff would go upstairs to see if Mark was free to see her visitor. And this was a time in my mind for the visitor to look around at this incredibly opulent room. So, the, so what the visitor might be, might would see and what you might be wondering about is what's on the ceiling and what's on the walls. And what's on this on the ceiling and the wall, are, it's wallpaper that was manufactured in England and it's called anaclypt wallpaper. And basically um, the, it's a wallpaper that is raised, it's embossed and it's um, stuck into the wall, almost like paper mache. You're not taking that wallpaper, that wallpaper off. And it's painted gold so that it will look very, very, rich and opulent. Um, and let's see, what else about this room? 
you know, you're going to notice that the Browns may have liked to travel, and they certainly did, especially Margaret. They acquired things like we do on our travels. Um, one thing that they acquired was called is called this black and white um, sculpture here, and I'll be showing you some of their other treasures that they bought when they traveled. Uh, so I think we're going to move on into the parlor and kind of position myself there. So if Mark was free to see a visitor, you would, the visitor would be escorted into the parlor to have, a, I'm going to put the flashlights down for a moment, um, to have a cup or <clears throat> to have a cup of tea. Now, um, Margaret had some rules for her visitors. One was that you did not discuss religion or politics. Um, another one was that you did not use slang. And the third one was that nobody under the age of 14 could come into the parlor. So, um, but before I tell you about the parlor, I, 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 you may be wondering, how did the Browns end up living in this absolutely beautiful house? And so here's the story. Um, Margaret and her husband, J.J. Brown, and their two children, Larry and Helen, were living in Leadville, Colorado. That's a small town, almost two hours west of Denver, up in the mountains. And Margaret was very busy raising her two young kids. And J.J. was working, um, working in the mining world. M mining was really big in Colorado and Leadville at that time. And um, JJ had worked his way up to being a, one of the supervisors or managers of what's called the Ibex Mining Company. And things were going fine. And then in 1893, there was a disaster. Um, we had a silver strike and costs of silver, the value of silver plummeted. And that was the economy in Leadville at that time. So Leadville was left with massive unemployment. But JJ wanted to keep his miners working. And let me tell you what, what was going on in the mining world then, and, and with J and, and at the Ibex Mining Company. There was a mine called the Little Johnny Mine. And um, starting um, and, and starting in 1880. Um, miners were digging into that mine and they would dig deeper and find this precious metal and dig deeper and find another precious metal. And JJ, all the while, would be figuring out a way to shore up the sides of the mine so the mine wouldn't cave in as they were digging deeper and deeper. And it was actually in 1892 that they found this incredibly, incredibly large horizontal vein of gold. And I'm stressing horizontal because it, was, it went this way. And that vein um, went into property that wasn't owned by the Ibex Mining Company. So think about it. You're in your backyard and there's something precious in the adjacent backyard. Are you gonna tell your neighbor? Maybe not. That was kind of the thought process. Um, what happened in 1892 was that the Ibex Mining Company went about buying up property that was adjacent to them, not letting the owners know that there was gold on their land. And then in 1893, they struck gold. It was a eureka moment, even though that they even though they, they announced that they 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 chose to announce that they found gold, even though it, it had been found in 1892. So JJ owned. Um, you know, shares of stock in the company. And he and Margaret became incredibly wealthy from this discovery. And in the spring of 1894, they decided to move to Denver with their kids. Why move to Denver? Denver was a happening city. This area was where the, millionaire, where the millionaires moved to. And our beautiful state capital with a real all gold dome had just been built in 1893. So they were house hunting. Their friends, Isaac and Mary Large wanted to sell the home. Margaret was into the most modern cutting edge technology and this home had it, so they bought, they bought this home. So that's how they came to be in this home. I'm gonna grab my flashlights here and show you some stuff. So as I mentioned, 
Um, Margaret and JJ like to travel, Margaret especially. And one thing I should tell you is that Margaret was fluent in multiple languages, multiple. We're not just talking one language. So that travel, be, you know, being able to get around like that was really important to her. I want to point out, I think I'm going to use my flashlight here. Yeah, um, this we have a sculpture here um, that they bought when they were traveling in Italy. Now, for those of you who have, who have traveled in Italy, you probably know that you're going to see a lot of nude sculpture, statues, stuff like that. And that's what this sculpture was when they brought it home from Italy. From Italy, but Margaret was concerned about her friends, their modesty, and everything. So I'm going to get a little bit closer here. She had a member of her staff crochet a shawl to to put around the sculpture to, you know, out of respect to her, for her friend's modesty. Another thing I want to point out, and this is Carter. I'm going to do this my double flashlight thing. Um, that works, I think. This painting at the very, very top is by a female painter named Helen Henderson Shane. Um, she's a she was a female paint um, a, a painter in Colorado, and um, Margaret liked to support women in the arts, so that's what she did. Um, any questions so far? Okay, um, so we are going to go into the library. Okay, so um, we're in the library. What I, I'm going to put my flashlights down for a second. Um, so this library used to be a parlor when um, when Isaac and Mary Large, the first owners, moved in, and um, Margaret converted it into Margaret and JJ decided to convert it into um, library, and. Um, and this is a good point. I, and I wanted to show you something. These bookcases here, these are original to the library. They were here when the Browns were here. So I wanted to talk about Titanic. Um, a lot of people come to the Molly Brown House Museum because they hear about, you know, Mrs. Brown and Titanic. So I want to tell you a little bit about that. Um, and I'm sure you probably already know a lot about Titanic. But as you probably know, um, on the night of April 14th, 1912, just a little bit before midnight, um, the Titanic um, uh, the ship struck, struck an iceberg. Um, what you probably don't know is that the time between the sighting of the iceberg and when it struck it, when it was less than a minute. So there wasn't a whole lot of time to avert that disaster. Now, the staff of the Titanic wasn't overly concerned at first. They didn't realize how much damage was done. But as the ship began to list and everything, um, an, or, an, um, an order was issued to all the passengers, everybody, um, to come up on the deck, you know, to put on their life vests and come up, up on deck. And so when so Margaret proceeded. Um, to, 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 not, um, to put on multiple layers of stockings, clothing. She wrapped a turban around her head. She stashed about $500 in her pocket and she came up on deck. And Margaret was the kind of person who really wanted to help out. That was her, that was her way to assess the situation and to try to help out. So, um, so, and, and a lot of people like Margaret were just milling about. There were, there were 20, there were a combination of 20 lifeboats and collapsible boats. And this is for about 2,200 passengers. Um, and what was happening is that the passengers early on did not want to get on the lifeboats. You know, it, it was like, why would you want to leave this beautiful ship with all the lights on its warm to go down into lifeboat into the pitch dark blackness 
and you know, be lowered, be lowered into the freezing cold Atlantic. So the first lifeboats that that um, that left were not full. It wasn't until towards the end that the lifeboat that the lifeboats were overflowing. But Margaret's walking around. She's kind of see, assessing the situation. And next thing she knows, two staff members come up behind her. They lift her under her, under her arms and they lower her about three or four feet down into lifeboat number six. And lifeboat number six could have held 65 people, um, but there were only 24 people on it. So um, Margaret and others set about, they took up oars, started rowing. Um, it was so bitter, bitter cold parts. They wanted to row to keep warm. And I can picture Margaret taking up this layer of clothing and that to give to other people to stay warm. So um, the next morning, uh, I should tell you that um, Titanic went down totally, I believe it was around 2.20 in the morning on April 15th. And um, the, these 20 lifeboats and collapsible boats combination, they were rescued the next morning by a ship called the Carpathia. And the captain of that ship was Captain Rostrum. And the captain, the staff, the people, the, the passengers on the ship could not have been more wonderful, you know, giving up, you know, rooms, blankets, you name it. Um, and, and, Mar and Margaret decided, you know, she wanted to, again, to help out. So Margaret took it upon herself to, talked to different passengers and she talked to not the wealthy passengers, they pretty much all knew each other, but she talked to other passengers. And what she learned is that a lot of these passengers were immigrants, they were coming for a better life in America and all that they had was on their backs, everything else, bottom of the Atlantic. <clears throat> so Margaret um, with, a, with a few other wealthy passengers um, decided to start a committee called the Titanic Survivors Committee. And they set about to do fundraising and they were really good fundraisers. Uh, what they did is they set up a sign um, uh, outside the um, uh, outside the, um, the main dining room and they would list the names of people who had donated and, their, and the amount. And then they had another blank sign in the list and the list of the names of people who hadn't donated. So there was massive competition, I think a little bit of guilt among the, the other wealthy passengers to donate. And in the three days it took to reach the New York City Harbor, they raised about the equivalent of $200,000 in today's dollars. So um, the Titanic Survivors Committee would go on to legislate for better maritime safety as well. So, um, but, but I want to talk about the library. I think what this meant to Margaret. Margaret, let me tell you a little bit about her background. Uh, Margaret was born in 1867, two years after the Civil War ended, and she was one of six children. The parents were Irish Catholic, were Irish Catholic immigrants named John and Johanna Tobin. And, they, and this family of eight lived in a four-room cottage in Hannibal, Missouri. They were dirt poor. John and Johanna Tobin decided to put all six children through eighth grade, which was the equivalent of about a 12th, of about the, of the equivalent of about a 12th grade education today. That would have been unheard of for girls to get that much education. That wouldn't happen and for this poor of a family to have all six children in school when those kids could have be out working and bringing in money, not heard of. So I always say kudos to, to the Tobins for doing that. But let me tell you, was an eighth grade education was not enough for Margaret. She wanted more education. So what she would see, so what Margaret would do throughout her life is she would hire tutors to teach her whatever she wanted to learn, whether it's languages, she played piano. And by the way, I should tell you when she was learning to play piano um, and, and when she was wealthy, she wanted her staff 
to learn whatever she was learning. Um, she wanted her staff to rise up in the world too. She never, Margaret never lost, that never lost sight of the fact that it was an incredibly lucky break that she acquired the wealth that she and JJ acquired. So um, Margaret had other values. Um, she was very altruistic. Um, she was very, she was a philanthropist. She was, invo she was um, involved in the women's suffrage movement. And I'll be telling you more about that later on. She had a passion for the rights of children, for animals. She did a lot. Um, any questions coming up? Not yet? Yeah, she played piano, yeah. And she, she also knew how to, yodel, knew how to do yodeling, by, by the way. So she was quite accomplished. So we are going to go into the dining room. <clears throat> Ready for me to start? Somebody asked if she had any children. If she had what? Had children. Yeah. Um, yeah, she did have children. Um, I'll be telling you more about them later, but she had two children and, and I'll be telling you more about them when we, when we go upstairs and show you pictures and everything. Keep the questions coming. And I'll, I'll, I definitely will talk about that. So we're in this beautiful dining room. Um, and Heather, I don't know if we have a picture of the ceiling or not, or if we can uh, do a con the person that's filming me, Heather, made a major contortion so I can show you this ceiling. Um, so when this home was built in 1889, it was customary to have a conservatory or greenhouse on the property. Um, this property, there just did not have room for that. So the original owners, Isaac and Mary Large, um, commissioned a painter to paint what would look like a um, but what would it make you feel like you're in a conservatory? When people come to the home, sometimes they notice what they notice are palm trees or giant spider web. And we have neither of these in, neither of these in the house or in Colorado. So, um, so that's what that is. And when Margaret and JJ moved in, Margaret loved whimsical stuff. And if this is not whimsical, what, what could be? So a couple of other things I want to point out. Um, we have, and I think I'm going to walk over here. I think you can see we have a really pretty punch bowl that um, was a gift to Margaret and JJ on their wedding. And we also have these tapestries. You can kind of see them. I'll get out of the way here um, that they acquired when they were traveling in Europe. But I want to talk to you a little bit about dining in Victorian times. Dining was an extravaganza. You were served by staff. Um, you did not come to you did not come to any milling or PJs or jeans. You were you dressed, and when I say you dressed, both men and women were wearing pounds of clothing. Clothing was very very heavy during that time, and the meals could be many many courses, 10, 12 courses, last for several hours. I think this would have been time for Margaret that she would have had luncheons with her friends. Um, she was a very gregarious, extroverted woman and loved to socialize, but she also wanted to um, engage her friends around the causes that she supported. And some of these causes were, um, she raised funds for um, she raised funds for and actually drove an ambulance in France in World War I. Um, she raised funds for a local animal shelter that we have here in Denver that was founded in 1910 and is still going strong today. Uh, she, uh, she, you know, so she was very involved in things. Um, she also raised awareness about juvenile justice. Um, she was good friends with a judge, her name, Judge Benjamin Lindsay. 
And um, they formed, uh, I don't know if it's the first juvenile justice system. I know it's first, what, first nationwide, okay. And the reason that they did it is that they were appalled that little kids, like a poor 10 year old child could steal, might steal an apple off the cart, you know, to feed, it, to, to feed himself. And he would be thrown into jail with hardened criminals. And so they wanted something better for these kids. Um, so that's what they did. And I'll be talking a little bit more about our activism as well. Um, any questions so far? besides the children. So we're going to go upstairs. But I want to point out a few things you're going to see on the way up. One is we have a really neat picture of Margaret when she was about 27 or 28. And she was dressed to um, going to be going to the opera that evening. I'd like for, for people to see this picture because most of us have, when we think of Mrs. Brown, we think of either um, Debbie Reynolds or Kathy, B Kathy Bates from the movies. And so Margaret was absolutely gorgeous. I want you to see that. A um, Couple of other things. Um, when you're going up the stairs, notice the staircase, notice the band of the banister and you may see it better on the second floor. It, that banister is machine made. And now we, you know, in modern times, now when we think machine made, you know, we think, oh, machine made, I want handmade. But keep in mind that during Margaret's time, this was um, post-industrial revolution, machine made was the newest thing. Um, so that was really cool stuff. And as you're walking up the staircase, you'll notice beautiful stained glass windows that were here um, when the Browns lived here. So I'm gonna meet you on the second floor. Okay, I'm gonna try to turn off my flashlight for a second. Um, although I may turn them back on. I, so um, I'm gonna ask, did, can people all see me or I wonder if I should, okay. I'm gonna play around with this, just to give a little bit more light. Um, so, so we're in the sunroom, which right now is the antithesis of sunny. It's evening and it's pretty dark in here. Um, so this is a room that visitors probably wouldn't, would not have seen that often, but it was a lovely place for the family to relax. And I'm going to point out a few things here. This sofa here is original to the Browns, not to this home. It's original to their home in Leadville. And um, the upholstery is, is horse hair fabric. And, um, but I wanted, I want to talk about the picture, some of the pictures and, and the people in them. So I'm going to focus on, and Heather, do we have a picture we can show of the Browns? Okay. So, um, I'm, so I'm going to focus in on, and I know Heather is showing a picture of this, of the Browns in Leadville. And, and I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the kids, each child when we get to their room. But um, we have Helen, daughter Helen on her father's knee. And that's JJ, Margaret, and then Larry. Larry, Larry um, came first and then Helen. Sometimes people ask, why, why is um, Larry wearing a skirt or a kilt? That was commonly done. Um, for a family of modest means, they would put their young boy in a skirt because when you think about it, boys, little boys are growing fat growing pretty quickly, you can let the skirt up, take it up and down. It's a whole lot easier, easier than to do that than with slacks. Um, so, um, and I want the time to show you a couple of other pictures here. Um, can we show a picture of Margaret, her campaign photo? Um, Heather's gonna show you that. And I'm showing you the original. 
Margaret ran for Congress three times. And I want to tell you a little bit about her. She was, uh, and her involvement in the women's suffrage movement. Uh, Margaret at one point um, lived in Rhode Island and worked on women's suffrage, women's suffrage causes to get women the right to vote. And something I should tell you is that women who did that in America were called suffragists, not suffragettes, as they were in England. The reason is, is that adding the et at the end, it was seen as kind of a demeaning kind of term. And in fact, um, here in America, if somebody called, called a woman, you know, a suffragette, it was con kind of considered a slur. Um, so they were called suffragists. So Margaret lived in Rhode Island and was very involved in get, give, getting the women the right to vote. And this happened when um, the 19th Amendment uh, was ratified um, on August 18th, 1920. So she, she was involved in other causes too, but that's big. Um, I want to tell you a little bit more though about um, Margaret and JJ and how they met. So, so Margaret, um, after, um, after she finished eighth grade and she went to work um, at what I think is a rather yucky job. Um, she worked at a, at a tobacco factory. Do you want me to kind of hold this up? Okay. She worked at, at a tobacco factory, stripping tobacco leaves. So she did that for several years. When she turned 18, her older brother, Daniel, with whom she was really close, um, sent her letter. Dan Daniel had moved out to Leadville, like out to Leadville, Colorado from Hannibal, Missouri. And like many men during that time, it was, you know, go westward, seek your fortune. And mining was a big thing in the West. Um, so Daniel encouraged Margaret to move out to Leadville. We don't know exactly what his letter said, but I'm thinking it may have been saying, hey, you're kind of, you know, kind of getting up there. Why don't you come out to Leadville? Maybe you'll meet somebody, get married. And he sent her the train fare um, to move out to Leadville. So she arrived in Leadville and early in the summer of 1886. And um, her, her sister, Marianne, was out also out in that area um, with her brother-in-law, John. And um, my understanding is that her brother-in-law and her brother um, it, it probably introduced uh, Margaret to this, to, to this, to this fellow that, that they knew, James Joseph or James or JJ Brown. And Margaret actually called him Jim, and they fell in love. Now, what I what I will tell you is that Margaret had hoped to marry a rich man, and the, the reason that she wanted to marry a rich man was so, so that she could help out her parents. Um, but what she but but she really fell in love with JJ. She felt that she wanted to follow her heart rather than the pocket. So they were so they were married in September eighteen eighty six. Uh, up at the Annunciate, up up at the Annunciation Church in Leadville, and that still stands today. Um, so they had, um, you know, a good marriage for many years. But in 1909, the marriage beca began to become frayed, and we don't really know what we don't know what happened, or you know, because they had had a very good marriage. What I can tell you is that JJ was 12 years older than Margaret. So there was a substantial age difference, but we don't know what caused them to break up. They did not divorce. They separated because they were strict Irish Catholics. And Margaret, Margaret got a sizable allowance in, in the house. And I will tell you more about JJ in a moment. But one thing I can tell you is that JJ died in 1922 and Margaret was, very despondent when he died. Um, I'm paraphrasing what she wrote, but she basically said that there would be there there would never be a man as fine as JJ. So there was a lot of love there. Um, any questions so far? Somebody wants to know if it's tin on the wall. No, good good question. That that's a very good question. Actually, on the wall, I'm going to use my flashlights here. Um, on, 
on the walls and also on the ceiling is, is what's called anaglypto wallpaper. Um, prior, prior to the pandemic, we would have a, a swatch of fabric that I could show you. So you're just gonna have to trust them. I'm trying to create this for you. It's fabric that it's, that's embossed. So it's raised a little bit and it's painted gold. And it is stuck on to the wall like you would or like paper mache. You, I mean, you are not taking that wallpaper down. Um, any other questions? Is the house in Leadville a museum also? Is the house in Leadville what? A museum. Um, no, not to my knowledge. No. Um, if you're, I mean, if you live in Colorado, there's a tremendous amount to, to see in Leadville, but um, no, their house. Not a museum. I'm not even sure if it exists, and I'm being told it does. And so, okay. Any other questions? Okay. So we're going to go and look at the bedrooms. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about each person. Okay, so this is the daughter Helen's room. Um, I'm gonna do what I can with my flashlights to kind of try to give 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 this some light here, <laughs> a little bit more light. Um, you're truly seeing this so it's what it looked like in Victorian times with it being pretty dark. Um, so the, so daughter Helen's room, this is um one of this is one of my favorite rooms. I think all the docents we each have a favorite room of the house. And um, so Helen, um, I, I, um, I'm gonna, I wanna tell you about her, but I do wanna point out her bed. This is the original bed that she slept in. And I mean, I think I would sleep beautifully in this kind of a bed, it's gorgeous. So oops, I'm gonna let people see this here. So, Helen, um, unlike her mom, who is very much social butterfly extrovert, Helen was very, very shy. Um, she, um, she, she, she actually studied at the Sorbonne in Paris. Um, she ended up marrying into a very wealthy publishing family. She married a gentleman named George Benziger. Um, and this is a publishing, the Benziger publishing family in New York City. And she and George Benziger ended up in um, the Long Island area. And I think we have a picture of Helen who is beautiful with her two children that we can um, show you. Okay, um, so that's kind of Helen. Um, one of the things I should tell you, um, I mentioned, always make sure I mention this at some point in the tour is that um, Helen and her brother, Larry, you know, they both had children, they had grandchildren. So the, the grandchildren were JJ and Margaret's great grandchildren. The great grandchildren did not know their great grandparents, Margaret and JJ, who had passed away before they were born. But the great grandchildren are just thrilled that we have this beautiful museum, the Molly Brown House Museum standing. Um, several of them are involved in it. I was delighted to meet. Um, another Helen Benziger, the great granddaughter several years ago. I mean, they're just so supportive and excited that, that we are keeping their family legacy, you know, alive. So that's really neat. Any questions coming through? Okay, so we're going to move over to the next room. So this is Margaret's room. And did I mention that she likes the color green just a bit? Um, she, it's you know, truly her Irish spirit coming out. Um, so this is a beautiful room, it faces south. And, you know, normally if this were daytime, light would be streaming in. Um, you're, you're, prob you're probably wondering like, why would Margaret and JJ sleep separately? It was considered a sign of wealth for 
everybody to have their separate bedroom. Um, this is not fact, but my take on it as well is that Margaret would be dressed in several different outfits by her staff. Eh, who knows? Maybe she wanted more privacy for that. Maybe JJ didn't want to have to deal with that, but that's what they did. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, um, I want to mention it, is when the Browns moved in, Margaret moved her parents in shortly after. They shared a bedroom. We're, we're not seeing that day because the bedroom's been turned into kind of a history of the restoration of the home. But um, the, but Margaret's parents, you know, moved in soon after. Um, one thing I want to point out, and this is not original, uh, this is not Margaret's original thing, but we have a day bed or a fainting couch um, over way over here. And during Margaret's time, if you were lucky enough to have staff who did everything for you, including making your beds, the last thing that you would want to do if you're, if it's like afternoon time, and you're thinking you'd like to lie down and read or close your eyes a bit, you, do, you would not do that on the bed. You would go to the day bed to take a nap or relax. Those, that, their, their staff was so busy that they're you know, cleaning, preparing a meal, maybe getting the carriages ready for a night on the town. And for the Browns, the last thing you wanted to have, them to have to do was to make the bed again. Um, any questions? Okay, we're gonna go across the hallway roughly. To JJ's room here. Okay, so this is JJ's room. You'll notice that it has a fireplace and um, this his room faces north. So even with central heating, it would be a little bit colder. Um, and this day bed here, this is this is his original day bed here, um, right in the corner. And, and by the way, I should tell you, when you see how we've laid out the furniture, how did we know how to do this? Um, and we have some photos that maybe Heather, who's filming me, can show you. Um, Ma um, Margaret it had a lot of parties. In 1910, she had a party to introduce um, niece, some nieces who were living with her to society. And at that party, she, got, she hired a photographer to take pictures of all the rooms except for the kitchen and the bathroom. And she had those photos labeled. That was invaluable to us to see exactly how each room laid its furniture out. Uh, because at the house, and I'll tell you about this later, went through different owners and different incarnations. So I'll tell you more about that. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about JJ because he's an important figure too. Um, JJ was born in Western Pennsylvania in 1855. Um, like Margaret, he didn't go to college, you know, um, but like, also like Margaret, he wanted to learn and he pursued education on his own. Um, when he was not very old, maybe late teens, he moved out west and he lived in different areas like Nebraska, um, South Dakota. And when he was living in South Dakota, he was pursuing being a minor. But JJ, he, he was a real go-getter. He was a go-getter. And I can picture JJ saying, well, yeah, I can just be a minor or I could learn a lot more. And so what he did is he apprenticed himself to a really experienced mining miner who was in management. And he learned things like not only mining, but the use of explosives and prospecting. And that enabled him to eventually rise up in the mining world. And so he, he, um, he lived in the Aspen for, for a little while and, and eventually ended up in Leadville. As I mentioned, um, when Margaret and JJ separated and JJ ended up living around the Southwest um, and on a trip back to visit daughter Helen in Long Island in 1922, that's where he had a fatal heart attack. And as I mentioned, is buried, is buried there. Um, questions so far? Okay. So we're gonna move on a little bit.
Okay, so this is Larry's room. And what I tell people, for people I've grown up in Colorado or the Southwest, and this was me before I became a docent, you look at the wallpaper and you say, oh, of course, it's Southwest. And actually it isn't. This wallpaper was popular in the period when the house was built. And it's of like a Turkish design. So it's not Southwestern. So to talk about Larry, um, kind of I phrase, talking about Larry, I feel like Larry is a child. You know, every family has a child that's going to give the parents more gray hair. And Larry was it, bless his heart. But Larry, he, um, he did go through high school and he went, and he went through college. He attended um, what was called the Colorado School of Mines. That school college still exists. That's about 10 miles west of Denver. Finished college. Um, he served in World War I in France. And sadly, he was exposed to mustard gas. Very, and he ended up in the hospital for several months. He was married and then he divorced. His parents were furious that he divorced. Um, and he ended up they, getting back with his wife, with the wife he divorced again, but they eventually were officially divorced. And um, he finally ended up marrying a silent film actress. And I can remember her first name, Mildred, not sure her last name, but it, and, <laughs> um, but in any case, he married a silent film actress and they eventually ended up in Southern California in the movie industry. He wasn't acting, but in the industry. So, um, so that's where he ended up and kind of found himself and settled down a bit. Um, any questions? Okay. Is there an attic? What's your what? Is there an attic? Um, there is an upstairs. Um, we're not going to see it today. Um, I don't believe that there's an attic. Um, it, the upstairs was used. Um, it housed the female staff, um, the male staff. And you're not going to see this today. We have what in the back um, with the Browns install, what's a carriage house, literally for the horse and carriage. Um, but it's now where we sell tickets for people to come to the museum. We have an incredibly wonderful gift shop and, and a male staff. Um, were housed in the second floor of the carriage house. But on the third floor now, um, we use that um, when we can get back to it, you know, when things are a little bit safer, we use that for social functions, high teas. Um, we do have a room up there. And I think um, I may be able to show you a picture of it towards the end of the tour, possibly of um, what, what we think a servant's room might look like, but we don't have an actual photo of it. Yeah, but there's not an attic. Any other questions? Okay, so Heather, I'm gonna talk about the bathroom, but Heather's gonna show it to you. Um, this is the most original room on this floor. And every fixture here, except for the tank above the toilet that was donated by somebody, um, every fixture was used by the Browns. And she made, people ask sometimes, but, is this the only bathroom? Because when you think about it, it was um, Mr. and Mrs. Brown, the children, and Margaret's parents, six people using one bathroom. But that was a lot more than most people had. So that's the bathroom there. So I am going to meet you all downstairs. Okay, so we, so we, as I have my back to the camera, so we are in the kitchen here. Um, I am going to, I'm going to tell you about the kitchen, but I want to show you some stuff too. Um, this kitchen is where the staff did its food preparation. Uh, we have two um, closets, two pantries. We have a cook's pantry. I'm not going to show you that. It's not, um, it's basically is where non-perishables for stored cleaning supplies. 
but we also have a butler's pantry. And this is where the staff would lay out the food before bringing it into the dining room. Can we show them? I just want to show them one thing. And I'm, I'm going to show you my absolutely favorite thing in the butler's pantry. And I'm maybe going to use my flashlight here. This thing here is a chocolate terrain with a, it's, it's a and I kind of Margaret um, reclining on her day bed with a nice cup of hot chocolate and a book. It's, it's just beautiful. So I'm going to show you <clears throat> a couple of other things. We have what's called an enunciator here. And the enunciator, this was like a call system. Um, basically, in, in the enunciator, it even has, <clears throat> excuse me, the like Mrs. Brown's or Mr. Brown. So if Margaret wanted, and I'll use my flashlight, if Margaret wanted to call a member of staff and she's in her room, she would press a button and the arrow on this would turn to show Mrs. Brown and there would be a bell that would ring and then and, and then um, servant would, re, would reset this by pressing this. Um, so, that, so that's the enunciator. So we have a stove here. And, and by the way, let me tell you about the kitchen. Um, the kitchen is decorated to look like a 1910 Sears and Robux kitchen. Um, this is from the Sears and Robux catalog. So you would see a stove like this. Um, and, and, and we know basically where the appliances, um, where, where, where they were because you, know, you have ghost prints where you move an appliance away from a wall. So this stove burned both coal and wood, not at the same time. And something you may be noticing, I'm gonna just put my flashlight on this. And you might be saying, I can picture those of you out there saying, wow, this home has cutting edge technology. Um, they, they have an instant pot. No, they don't have an instant pot. That's pretty modern, but they, but this is a pressure cooker, a predecessor to the instant pot. And by the way, pressure cookers were, um, were invented in Denver. And so kind of a neat thing. So any questions so far? Okay, so I wanna kind of wrap up here a little bit um, to tell you about what happened to the house and also what happened to Margaret. Margaret, let me talk about Margaret. So Margaret, in my mind, even in 2021, she would be this amazing woman now who was doing so much with her life. You know, she had, you know, raised kids. She was a women's suffragette, suffragist. And her kind of her last phase was that she decided to study acting. There was a famous actress during that time period named Sarah Bernhardt. And who knows, maybe... Margaret wanted to emulate her. So Margaret moved to New York City to what, to what was called the Barbizon Hotel for Women. And this hotel was a, for aspiring women, actresses, artists, that kind of thing. And Margaret um, studied acting, she taught acting. And my understanding was that she was quite a good actress. Late one night on October 28th, 1932, she was discovered dead. She was. 65 years old. So what else was happening in 1932? The height of the depression. So you have, so you have daughter Helen in New York, um, son Larry in California, and nobody in, nobody here in Denver. So what do you do about the house? They decided to sell not only the house, but its belongings as well. And the house went through different owners. Um, it was a men's boarding home at one point. Um, it was a home for wayward girls, not at the same time, not simultaneously. Um, and then it eventually was built by a gentleman mis named Mr. Art Leisingring, who really appreciated the history of the home. And, and he really, and he wanted to keep it up and everything. But he decided that he wanted to sell it in 1970. And what was happening in Denver then was what was called urban renewal. And, law, and what urban renewal meant 
for many structures in Denver is that they were bought, they were sold, they were torn down and very often turned into parking lots. Um, and, he and he was really fearful that this would happen. And so what he did, he reached out to a former governor's wife whose name was Ann Love and they and a few other concerned citizens formed Historic Denver, which owns a home today. Historic Denver raised the funds to buy the home. And soon after it, after it opened, the Molly Brown House Museum opened. Um, so, you know, so we, we've been open for a long time. I think we're nearing our 50th anniversary, yay. Um, so that's basically the story. Um, are there any other questions? So I'm gonna quote another docent who we all adored. And I just wanna thank you, first of all, for coming on this tour. It's been a delight to, I can't see you all, but I know you all are out there. So thank you for your questions um, and just sending you a lot of love, light and peace in your lives. So thanks so much and have a good evening. Okay. Oh, okay. I am supposed to talk about the next tour. Um, and okay. Oh, this is cool. Um, I'm not sure what LCJM is. Uh, Lily. <laughs> uh, Lily Carol Jackson. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So on um, the next tour that's coming up is about Lily Carol Jackson. It's the Lily Carol Jackson Museum. And I know I'm looking down at, at this phone. So born in 1889, Lily Mae Carol Jackson was the seventh of eight children in her family. And in 1935, she became the president of the Baltimore chapter of the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP. And she quickly grew the chapter's membership from 100 in 1935 to 17,600 in 1946, making Baltimore one of the largest chapters in the country. This is the next tour, by the way. Um, Lily Carol Jackson and her family became known as the Civil Rights Dynasty for the work they did that, not, that shaped not only Baltimore, I know, we, I know that we have one Baltimore attending here, um, but the nation. Little, Lily Carol Jackson died in 1975 and willed her home to Virginia Jackson Kia, her eldest daughter for the development of a museum to honor the legacy of civil rights activism that was pioneered in Baltimore and showcase the work of those who fought for freedom. In 1978, the museum opened as Baltimore's first privately owned civil rights museum honoring an African-American woman. The museum is now a part of the illustrious Morgan State University's Office of Museums and continues to serve as a site for community, active, for community advocacy. And you can learn more about this museum. I'll give you the website. It's www.lilliecarolljacksonmuseum.org. Um, and I think if you look on the website, actually, um, for, the, for, for the Lombard organization where you register tonight, you can click on these museums to learn more about it. So I hope you will partake in other tours as well. And I truly hope that you enjoyed my tour tonight. I certainly enjoyed touring you all. Yes, one more question. Oh, of course. Why did uh, the book author choose Molly instead of Margaret? Um, this is my, and I may, I may get the person Heather's filming and she oversees the speakers bureau, but so Heather, please correct me if I need more information. Um, you, you know, uh, newspapers in that time when Margaret died in 1932, we had new, two newspapers. And if you've seen newspapers of that time, there's a lot of hype. I mean, this, we're not talking the New York Times. We had the Rocky Mountain News and the Denver Post. And there were tons and tons of newspapers in towns. And they were pretty sensationalistic. 
Um, and I don't recall if in one of her obituaries, what she called her Molly or, yeah, so she was called Molly. And I do know in the, at least one of them that they spoke about Margaret in not very flattering terms. And it was in 1933 that the columnist Eugene Fowler, I think he was with the Denver Post, that he wrote this book called Timberline. Um, and I had to get a hold of it because I had to read. It was, Timberline was basically stories of different Colorado personalities, one of whom was Margaret Brown. It could call the unsinkable Molly, you know, titled the, the, the unsinkable Molly Brown. And my own personal reaction, you know, I think we're really appreciative. We want to correct the myths. And there are a lot of myths when you see the movie, the unsinkable Molly Brown. Um, but by the same token, being aware of, you know, Debbie Reynolds herself gave tremendous support to get, the, to get this museum going. And we're tremendously appreciative. I, I don't think if it were, you know, people hadn't seen that movie, and then maybe later on James Titanic's Cameron, uh, or Jane Cameron's Titanic, that there would be such a drive to see, to see this home. But I think we're really appreciative of you know the publicity and the movies and Debbie Reynolds for helping to get things going. So any other questions? Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Um, as I said, love, light and peace to all of you. Um, I hope you have a very good evening. Take care, bye-bye.